Hi there, this is Ike Ahmed from the University of Toronto. I give a talk on MIG gets complicated. There are so many new MIG procedures out there now. A few years ago we only had one and now we've got over 10. So it's a bit of a mismatch on what's happening out there. And uh, my talk centered around trying to differentiate the different products. Uh, when it comes to MIGs, probably the easiest way to differentiate the different devices, which we are now widely applying in cataract surgery and sometimes often standalone, is based on the outflow, uh, whether it's Shems Canal based, uh, supraciliary based, or subconjunctival. And a convenient way to look at it is dividing those up between internal MIGs, which is the internal drainage pathways, and then subconjunctival. And that's a good way to kind of differentiate the mechanism of action, the safety, and efficacy as well. And I think MIGS has really kind of sprung up on, on us. It's really a procedure that's very well aligned with cataract surgery. Very much like, I like to say, toric lenses are used for astigmatism. You know, MIGS is something that I think we really encounter and look towards with patients who have glaucoma and cataract. And as I said, we're looking at this more and more for standalone. In terms of SEMS canals, this has been where there's been the most amount of activity. Uh, and again, we can differentiate these between those that are microstenting approaches, those that are more visco viscodilatory, and those that are cutting or goniotomy approaches. Of, of course, when it comes to stenting procedures, uh, the eye stent uh, is, of course, the most, uh, most commonly used and was the first MIGS device approved in the U.S. The hydrus is yet to be approved, but uh, will hopefully be soon as well and has similar mechanisms of action in terms of dilating the canal um, and bypassing the canal uh, in its action as well. And then we have other approaches, uh, which include viscodilatory, and that is the ab internal canal plasty technique and the visco360 approaches. Those basically dilate the canal to intentionally create a plasty effect. And then we have cutting approaches, which, is, which will include uh, uh, goniotomy techniques using cutting techniques and ablative techniques. And cutting kind of techniques, we have uh, abilities to use the GAT procedure to basically cut the inner wall, uh, the KDB blade, as well as trap 360. And then finally, the trabectome, which was actually one of the first mixed devices that uh, came around, is ablative. So those, those basically essentially all devices that are designed to bypass uh, the, the, uh, the inner wall of the canal and then have other mechanisms to dilate uh, or to expand the canal. So in terms of differentiating the devices, I like to look at target pressure. And those patients who have a target pressure that are, let's say, 15 or greater or greater than 15, those work well for internal mixed procedures. And we talked, in, we I talked basically again between uh, Shems Canal and supraciliary approaches. When it comes to the safest option with the least amount of risk and the lowest maintenance, I generally have found that procedures that typically use stenting approaches have been, have been most aligned in this area. And again, we don't have really good head-to-head -head data to compare the different options, but if we're looking for something that is totally you know, uh, low maintenance, ultra safe, we may be wanting maybe for perhaps a further IOP lowering, but certainly a single stent or viscodilation is extremely safe. When we're looking at patients, for example, also we want a safe approach, maybe we want to get a bit more out of the, out of the device you know, outside the U.S., we've seen, uh, you know, examples using multiple stents, uh, using the scaffolding stents may, may help us in that, in that way. And then some of the goniotomy approaches we talked about, cutting techniques may perhaps give us a bit more effect, although, again, we really don't have good comparative effect between the two. We do, of course, know that, um, that these options all, again, have generally a floor uh, below which it's hard to get below, which is episcopal venous pressure. And then going internal again, but the potential, and again, yet to be proven yet, but the potential to perhaps access more aqueous outflow is a supraciliary space. And that is the now recently approved SIPAS device, which is an ab internal supraciliary stent. And then patients who really we want to get uh, lower, hit lower targets, which I think is very important for a lot of our glaucoma patients, uh, patients who maybe don't tolerate medications as well, or who want, who want to have the greatest chance to be off medications, is the ab internal uh, Zen implant, which is a bleb form procedure, but it's really a lower maintenance bleb. It's a straightforward bleb uh, with a maintenance that is very different than our traditional uh, glaucoma surgeries that we see. So that's kind of MIGS complicated, if you want to call it, in terms of summarizing it. A lot of different things out there. It's confusing a bit and differentiating based on a different mechanism of action, as well as the specific differences within Shem's Canal may help us a little bit to differentiate one or the other. At the end of the day, I think it's going to be what the, what the, what the market shows, what our patients, how they respond. And again, we look forward to more head test studies to compare these devices uh, going forward. Thank you very much.